This is the second interview I'm doing uh, on the conflict uh, in Syria, and I'm interviewing Joost Hilteman. Joost Hilteman is the uh, manager for the Middle East and Northern Africa of the International Crisis Group, and both he and the International Crisis Group write articles, write analyses on many conflicts, but specifically uh, on, on the Middle East and on Syria. And that's why I'm interviewing him. Um, and the nice thing about their uh, their analyses is that they're not just analysis what's go of what's going on, but they're also giving recommendations to the different parties in the conflict, state actors, uh, non-state actors, and the international community. And I recommend you check out the articles and, and uh, the pages I have shared below. Now, I've divided the uh, interview into three parts to make it more understandable, and I need to give a very short introduction to to uh, make it a bit clearer. There are three territories in Syria. There's a regime-held territory, uh, there is um, the opposition-held territory in, in, in Idlib, and there is uh, eastern Syria. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those. Um, one way of really checking out quickly what's going on, what really, what's really helpful, is to Google Syria live map or look at the link below and you'll get a map of Syria where the different provinces are and who holds sway where. But I'll explain it now in the province of Idlib, uh, in the northwest, it is the uh, mostly Islamist opposition that's in control. And um, uh, on the north they are bordered by Turkey and on the roughly on the south and the east it is the regime held by the Russians, uh, Iran, and Hezbollah that controls that territory. So they're totally encircled, um, the province of Idlib, that is. Um, the militias there are dominated by Islamists, um, and there, but there's also other Sunni opposition and even secular opposition, um, but they're not the ones who have the most control. I wouldn't say that the local population is necessarily a huge fan of these Islamist oppositions, but uh, of course uh, these uh, these groups have the most uh, firepower on the ground, so that's why they hold control uh, in uh, in the province of Idlib. Uh, they're surrounded by uh, by the regime, and it's uh, they're in a very dire situation. So that's the first uh, topic I will discuss with Jos Hilteman. Then I'm looking to the east uh, of uh, Syria, and there is a very different situation there. There you have the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Um, and uh, they're dominated by the uh, YPG, the uh, the Kurds, uh, in combination with other secular opposition. And the interesting thing um, um, about the uh, the SDF or the east of uh, Syria is that, uh, as in Idlib, there is many foreign fighters with the Islamists. In the east, there are two thousand Americans embedded, and by now a thousand uh, Frenchmen. And they're basically holding the, uh, the territory in the east um, together with the Syrian Democratic Forces. It's quite important to get a picture of what's going on on the ground. If you check out a map, you'll see that basically the opposition in the east, uh, the Kurds with the, uh, the secular Sunni opposition roughly, is holding three provinces, Raqqa, Hasaka, and Deir Ezzur. That's the central north, the northeast, and the east of Syria. And uh, yeah, so that's the territory that they're holding. So the second part of the interview will be a series of questions about the East. What's the situation? What's going on? Where would that go uh, in the coming time? And finally, I will ask some questions uh, generally about the conflict and its direction to Mr. Hultemann. Thank you very much for um, watching the interview and I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, we currently have um, sort of a ceasefire in, in Idlib, a halting of the hostilities. Um, it's rather fragile. Uh, Idlib is one of the two remaining areas, um, this one is in the northwest of Syria, where the opposition still still stands. Um, and I have a couple of questions and you can answer them any way you like. Uh, do you expect the ceasefire to hold? Or do you expect a stop and start war where the regime sides try or the Russians try to push for concessions? Um, and do you think that there's a difference in what the regime is looking for or what Russia might be looking for? Uh, around this uh, this Idlib uh, assault at the moment. So the first of all, thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, to talk about these things in some detail because I think it's very important that we understand how complex the situation is um, and to get a, a more of a nuanced view of it because from the outside looking in, especially for the non-specialist, it can be be bewildering um, and and often it turns into a black and white sort of situation, mm -hmm. good and bad versus bad or whatever. 
Yeah. And, and the situation on the ground doesn't lend itself to such simplifications. Um, so I, I should say that um, the regime of Bashar al-Assad and the Russians uh, are agreed that all the territory of Syria, currently not under the regime control, should revert to regime control, should be retaken from whoever controls it, uh, rebels in one case, in another case the Islamic State uh, and groups like that, mm -hmm. and then in the third case uh, Kurdish uh, groups that are not technically rebels, but uh, that do control territory that uh, is not currently in the hands of the regime. So. Um, that being the case, uh, there may be different ways of bringing this about. And the regime may have a different view of this than the Russians. The regime would like to take all of it back as soon as possible, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the military capability to do so. It is very much dependent on Russian air power and uh, the ground support of Iran-backed groups like Hezbollah and others uh, to win battles on the ground. Um, and so uh, it has had, had to do it in a staggered fashion, successively. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, the neighborhoods of, uh, of Damascus were targeted uh, earlier this year, and then uh, south southwestern Syria near the Golan Heights, uh, and including the Golan Heights. Mm -hmm. And then um, now there was a, a movement towards uh, Idlib, uh, into Idlib province, toward Idlib town. That offensive uh, was suspended. But suspended is the word, it's not cancelled. Um, clearly the aim of the Russians and the regime is to retake this area. But the Russians clearly uh, meant to, for this to be done uh, gradually and not in one shock. And there is reasons for that. Uh, we have to remember that Idlib uh, for the last year has been a de-escalation zone. Mm -hmm. But the southwest was also a de-escalation zone and so was eastern Huta. And that didn't protect them from mm -hmm. regime offensive with Russian support. The excuse, if you want to, to call it that, that the Russians had for attacking these de-escalation zones that it agreed to, is that uh, there were jihadist groups that fall outside of the de-escalation agreement. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to be targeted even during the de-escalation. Um, and uh, their presence there um, was an excuse then to go in and to remove them and to retake these areas for mm -hmm. the regime. Mm -hmm. The same is true in Italy, but, with, with even, but even to a greater extent, because the uh, jihadist groups are predominant in Italy as opposed to the southwest or even uh, the Damascus uh, suburbs. <clears throat> and so it's only a matter of time <clears throat> before the Russians say, listen, um, we agree that Idlib is a de-escalation zone, but it's full of jihadists who have no right to be there, and we're going to take them out. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in the process, you take the whole province. Mm -hmm. um, so that started just in the last month, uh, where the Russians said, um, you know, it's time, Turkey, our partner in the mm -hmm. de-escalation zone with Iran, that you do something about the jihadist presence mm -hmm. uh, in Idlib or else. And this is when the massing of troops started and some shelling uh, in the perimeter uh, of the province. Um, and that led to uh, intense negotiations between Turkey and Russia. Russia wants to proceed, but not at the expense of breaking its relationship with Turkey. Mm -hmm. Because it needs Turkey to drive a wedge in the Western alliance. Because Turkey, of course, is a NATO yes. partner. Yeah. And, and so it has an advantage in having Turkey on its side. Turkey, in turn, needs the Russians for the simple reason that it realizes that Russia can change the military situation on the ground in Idlib and that this would be um, to the disadvantage of Turkey because uh, any military offensive in Idlib would probably send a new flow of refugees into Turkey, which is already housing more than three and a half million of them. And jihadists, of course. And, and including jihadists who, who could destabilize the country in significant ways and who could also move on to Europe, of course. Turkey doesn't care about too much about that probably, but does care about who stays behind in Turkey and can create trouble there, especially if the jihadists blame Turkey for having given up course, Italy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what does Turkey do? How does so, so Turkey so wanted to negotiate with Russia, and Russia wanted to negotiate with Turkey in order to preserve their relationship. And so we have a temporary holding pattern in Idlib where the Russians have agreed to, uh, to suspend the offensive, and Turkey, in exchange, now has to show that it can do something about the jihadist presence. And the first place where it does it is a, 
a, non, a demilitarized zone mm -hmm. surrounding the Idlib province, uh, part of, of the area that was previously under rebel control, uh, and to remove the jihadists from there. And to allow, because uh, it includes the, the major archery between uh, Damascus and Aleppo, the highway yeah, and four, uh, to, to free that of uh, control, so traffic can flee from so economic from traffic. Area. And what I've also read is that they want uh, there is drone attacks yes. by the rebels, no, by well, the rebels. Also, yeah, yeah. from from inside that zone, more or less, yeah. on the Russian air base at Hamaymen. Yeah. So the Russians clearly don't want that kind of military harassment. And so they want to push back the distance that, so that the rebels cannot bridge yeah. it. And we have to see whether, even if the rebels are, or jihadists, whatever they are, are removed from this particular area, whether uh, these, this air base will no, no longer be attacked, because yeah. maybe they will have other means of attacking yes, it. Of and in the end, that will be the pretext for retaking the entire pr uh, yeah. province. Yeah. So there's no guarantee this deal will not hold. In a way, it is a, it's a method the Russians are using to get the Turks get used to the idea that they're going to lose this place yeah. without cr creating major upset. Or, or yeah, without uh, loss, of, loss of face. Uh, or, 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 um, but then there, there is uh, um, so at least two questions. The first question would be then, um, the idea would be for the, uh, for, the, for the Turks to get rid of the international jihadis or for, yes. of, of the uh, jihadis in Idlib uh, province. Um, so my first question would be, what's the idea? Would the idea be that the jihadis, for argument's sake, are taken out and then the other rebels, they negotiate with the regime or then that will be used as a pretext to, for them to go next? So the question is, how difficult will it be for Turkey to, to get rid of the jihadis and how many are there? And how would they then convince the other rebels uh, to, to cooperate? Yeah, this is, this is the, the, the hub of the problem. Um, and I'm not advocating anything here, but I'll tell Just you what, what, the Russian, what the Russians want. Um, the Russians want the Turks to take care of the, the hardcore jihadists, and that means to defeat them, uh, or to bring them into Turkey through a deal, but yeah. I don't think Turkey would want that. So it would also prefer to defeat them, but it doesn't have actually military troops on the ground in Idlib, no. except for military observation posts. Yeah. So it doesn't really have the capability to confront the jihadists directly. So it's in a real dilemma. It doesn't yeah, know what to do. It's a predicament. Uh, from the Russian perspective, um, the strategy has been in the past, also in eastern Ruta and Duma yeah. uh, in, in Damascus and in the southwest, is to start talking to the rebels and to start peeling off groups of rebels from the core, more and more and more, until you're left with a small core, which you then militarily defeat. That's the strategy from the Russian perspective. And they say, okay, there are rebels who will uh, reconcile, as they call it, mm -hmm. and they will come back to the regime side. And they will be dealt with in a fair way, the Russians say. Yeah. Of course, from the other side, it's uh, complete distrust. Yeah. Uh, they know that maybe they will be put in the military or in prison and tortured or, or disappeared, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, but that is, from the Russian side, one mm -hmm. option. The other one is that uh, they disappear. They melt away in the population, uh, take off whatever uh, garb, garb yeah. and, and uh, act like civilians. The third one is that they uh, escape into Turkey and yeah. with refugees going into Turkey yeah. and melt away that way. And the fourth one is that they will be killed. Yeah. So for the Russians, those are the four options available to the rebels. There are no other options. Okay. And is there a, a, a larger uh, aim? This, these are the, 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 say the regular aims for the, for the Russians. They know they can put pressure on Turkey and, um, and the West here, uh, through, through Idlib, uh, indirectly. Um, do they want a, a, a seat at the geopolitical table? Do they want to make additional demands, let's say, around Ukraine or something? Or is it really just about their own interest in terms of military, uh, economics, oil deals, etc., and having their ally in Syria? What, what are the... The, the only link to Ukraine uh, is, is that they want uh, to succeed in Syria in order to have that leverage in general. Yeah. Uh, if it were to lose in Syria, then its situation in Ukraine will be weakened as well. Yeah. So, uh, if it's tied down for a long period of time yeah. in Syria, for example, and they don't want to know Afghanistan, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't look like that at the moment, no. but uh, it could become it. They may win the war, but lose the peace, for example, yeah. if there's not yeah. sufficient st stability in the post-conflict era. But uh, for now, it looks like Russia will uh, succeed. 
uh, and that's all that they want. Yeah. Um, but they want to have the guarantee that the regime will survive, yeah. um, and that the country will be stable, and that Russia's interests therefore are preserved. But beyond that, uh, it faces a lot of challenge, a uh, number of challenges mm -hmm. as well. One is uh, the presence of Iran, uh, because in the end, the Russians are not particularly enamored of Iran mm -hmm. and don't want the, the Syrian regime to be taken over by Iran. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so they have in fact let, allowed Israel to attack Iran in Syria. Yeah. Uh, this may be changing now because of the incident with the Russian plane that was shot down. But um, uh, in any case, so far, they have benefited from the from Israeli attacks on Iranian assets and personnel in um, in Syria. Uh, the Russians also uh, it is easier to to say than to do uh, to bring about stabilization. They will need uh, significant uh, reconstruction funds, and the only ones who can provide those a significant amount are the Europeans. But the Europeans are not willing to do it until and unless there is a meaningful political transition, which would probably lead to the end of the regime, which what Russia doesn't want. Yeah, yeah. So you see, Russia also faces a predicament. And it may not be able to get out of Syria very easily, because it won't be stable. Yeah. As long as it isn't stable, military, you need to protect the yeah, regime. Yeah, involvement. Um, could you, while we're on the topic of, of Iran, uh, Iran has had its influence, let's say, through the, uh, the Shia in southern uh, Iraq, through uh, the Alabi or pro-Iranian regime in Syria, and of course Hezbollah uh, in, in, in the south of, uh, or in significant parts of Lebanon. Um, uh, is this also the geopolitical role, or what are the uh, the interests of Iran staying there, there long term? Well, so Iran, first of all, Iran has had an alliance with Syria since the uh, 1980s, even before, uh, with the Assad regime. Uh, Syria was the only uh, Arab state in the Mashrek, in the Middle East, that uh, supported Iran during the Iran-Iraq war against the, so the, uh, yeah, the yeah. opposed to Iraq. They were both Ba'ath ruled, but the Ba'ath didn't yeah. get along. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, that friendship, that partnership goes back a long way. Um, in 1982, uh, during the Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, of Lebanon actually, uh, the, uh, the Iranians helped set up, uh, which of course Iran was then a uh, the newly revolutionary yeah, regime yeah, uh, set up Hezbollah. Yeah, yeah seven, nine, sorry, two, three years later, mm -hmm. set up Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, to fight back against Israel. And since that time, uh, it has kept Hezbollah alive through uh, weapon supplies. And that has, by you know, by because it was the only way. It, was, yeah, yeah, it has yeah. gone through Syria. So Syria became the hub. And um, uh, and that until today. Uh, for Iran, Hezbollah is what it calls its forward defense. Uh, if Iran feels threatened by Israel because it has nuclear weapons uh, and it has other means of attacking Iran, I'm not saying Iran, Israel is about to attack Iran, but from the Iranian yeah. perspective they feel threatened, then uh, Hezbollah is your first line of defense because the Hezbollah's rockets will reach Israel. Yeah. And those rockets are supplied by Iran via Syria. Yes. yes. So, um, so that's a critical lifeline. Uh, and those were retaken, I think those those direct routes to southern Lebanon were retaken about a year ago or... No, 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 they have not been retaken. They, oh, they, they were always available. They, they continue to be available. And and so that is for, for Iran the bottom line. It might live with another regime in Syria as long as it's a regime that will protect those interests. Yeah. And of course, since it cannot imagine a regime that would do that, it sticks by the, with the current one. Um, so it doesn't. The Iranians don't care about Idlib. They don't care about North, East Syria, and, and who yeah. runs there. It may want to help the regime in retaking these areas, but the, but it's not the core of the Iranian interest. Okay. okay. Um, then I might come back to this, but uh, let's move to to Northeast. Yes. The uh, the area where the uh, the Kurds hold control. Yeah. Um, uh, currently, that is uh, most of. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Most of Raqqa, uh, Hasaka, and, and Deir Ezzur, especially Hasaka being, uh, say, the heartland of the Kurds in uh, in Syria, um, with uh, help from the Americans, the the the, 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 the YPG, the armed uh, wing of the PYD, uh, the Kurdish, let's say, communist. It's not communist. No, it's not communist. Socialist. What is it? Explain. It's PKK. PKK. Whatever that okay. is. Okay. Yeah. Whatever that is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but they have, uh, with American help, they have retaken uh, uh, big parts of Raqqa and, and Deir Ezzur. 
Um, and about four months ago, the, uh, there was an attack or a response, uh, uh, and the Americans, together with the Syrian Democratic Forces, as they're called, which is the Kurds plus other secular... Other, yeah, but YPG controlled. Yeah, YP, YPG controlled, obviously. Um, they killed over 200 Russian mercenaries, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of silence, let's say. There was, there was not, not a really a big political reaction from Moscow. Right. Um, and uh, what happened, correct me if I'm wrong, was that uh, the Russians and the regime then focused in the south of, uh, of, uh, of Syria and a kind of line was drawn. Now I want to describe two scenarios and then I want to ask you what you think is, uh, is most, uh, most likely uh, with this line in the sand. Um, the, the first scenario which seems most likely is that um, uh, at some point the Americans who have 2,000 embedded advisors uh, in the uh, uh, YPG um, that they would withdraw, um, necessitating a deal between Damascus uh, and the Kurds, and a situation by which the regime would uh, basically retake those territories and have arrangements militarily or politically uh, as they had before, with with steady Russian and or steady um, Syrian troops in the in the northeast. That's scenario one. Um, scenario two two is less likely. Uh, would be that um, uh, pending a deal with the Russians and some kind of negotiation between uh, the, the big powers or the opposition and the regime, uh, the Americans would ha keep helping the Kurds or keep helping uh, the SDF uh, contain that, that area uh, and Europe would do what Trump is asking it to do to, to help rebuild those three uh, northeastern provinces or to provinces to to, to finance them, to help help rebuilding. That would be a kind of de facto um, temporary or de, but de facto uh, division of the country where the, like now, part of the opposition holds control. Um, now, given these two rough scenarios, is uh, first question, which one do you think is more likely and what do you think Europe, Europe being asked to, to foot the bill of one of these scenarios? What, what should Europe do? So, so everything hinges on the American posture here. Uh, do they withdraw or do they stay? And with this administration, that's unclear. Yeah. Um, because they don't have a clear, uh, straightforward policy. Um, Trump uh, in March announced, uh, said that he wants to withdraw, withdraw all the troops from Syria. Uh, but the people around him, Bolton, Pompeo, Matisse, don't want to do it. Yeah. And who will prevail? We'll have to see. Uh, yeah. As we move forward, uh, because uh, Trump is, of course, personally uh, weakened because of all the scandals surrounding him, um, but uh, he's still the president and he has the final word on these yeah. decisions. So um, it's unclear what will happen. Uh, the, he wants out because he's more of an isolationist, uh, doesn't want to have a military footprint in the Middle East. He's not different from Obama in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're very different in many other senses. <laughs> um, and uh, Matisse and Pompeo and Bolton, uh, they see uh, uh, an Iranian threat that, well, they see, they see three reasons for the United States to mm -hmm. stay on the ground. One is an Iranian threat that's emerging, to them emerging, possibly a land corridor through Iraq, Syria, to the Mediterranean, um, that would threaten Israel. Um, uh, secondly, uh, the continued presence of I ISIS uh, holdovers um, uh, who may come back if uh, there is not sufficient stabilization yeah. uh, that would discourage them from coming or yeah. uh, prevent them from coming yeah. back. And thirdly, um, it's leverage uh, in any negotiations over the future of Syria and the future of the regime in particular. So um, from, from a rational point of view, from that, that, that makes sense. Uh, from the American point of view, if that's if that's what the, if these are the three goals, then keeping a presence, military presence on the ground, makes sense. Yeah. I'm not again not advocating, but I'm yeah. saying, yeah. so um, the um, no. When it's, so I, the, of the two scenarios, I would say the the first is is uh, more likely, though not maybe in the short term. Eventually, the United States has no interest in staying uh, um, uh, beyond the Iranian threat. I think is exaggerated. Mm -hmm. uh, Daesh, yes, Islamic State is a problem, uh, but it's more or less defeated, and uh, with the, the proper means, uh, uh, you, you can uh, prevent their return. 
And when it comes to leverage, um, it's not that much leverage, frankly. Mm -hmm. And um, Russia has been in the driver's seat since 2015, um, and um, in the end, it will get more or less what it wants. So, so I don't, I don't s s see that, and I, I therefore do see uh, the, the a great potential uh, for a deal between the YPG and the regime in Damascus mm -hmm. about um, what the future of the Northeast should be. And um, and there should and the, and the, and the, the, the key problem will probably be who will be have security control on the ground in the Kurdish areas, not necessarily in Raqqa or Deir Ezzur, which are Arab areas mm -hmm. currently under YPG control or SDF control. Yeah. But in Rojava, what the YPG yeah. and PKK call it Rojava, uh, the strictly Kurdish or they're mixed areas also, but yeah. majority Kurdish areas. Um, and that, 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 of course, is a red line for both sides, yeah, yeah. and we'll have to see. For Damascus, it's got to be the Syrian security f services, yeah. and for uh, the YPG, uh, they are willing to put their fighters mm -hmm. under the Syrian army, but they do not want the Syrian security police to come back to yeah. these areas, yeah. because they have been the problem in the past, of course, of suppressing course. the Kurds. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the regime, uh, where, where they may agree, is that the regime would put its military forces back on the border with Turkey. And that might also be enough for Turkey to accept yes. such a deal, though I don't want to predict that Turkey will be satisfied with that. Um, on the issue of, of uh, uh, the Americans wanting Europe to, to help mm -hmm. with uh, uh, reconstruction, uh, you said development or yeah, uh, reconstruction, reconstruction in, the, in these areas. Um, I don't think the Europeans would, from the discussions I've mm -hmm. had here in Brussels, the Europeans will not agree to this because the, they, uh, they support the territorial integrity of Syria and don't want it to be partitioned. Mm -hmm. And so um, while they are not happy about the regime coming back to these areas and want the regime to be gone and to be a meaningful political transition in Damascus, they also will not support any kind of reconstruction in areas currently not under regime control. Uh, because they, that could lead to partition, mm -hmm. or it could lead to a regime takeover with a gift. Yeah, reconstructed yeah, sure. areas, which uh, you know they're not going to make that gift to, to this regime. Yeah. So. But um, is it not, uh, if we think of, of, of European interests, let's say in, in return of some refugees or in, in preventing future uh, migration, uh, would it not be in Europe, in Europe's interest to? develop these areas anyway? I mean, I know there's a taboo on it because for the exact reasons you've just described, um, but would it not be likely that they would want to anyway, or that they, that the Europeans might want to show, look, here's some opposition controlled currently area and they're doing quite well, you, we can use this in leverage in some kind of future arrangement, or has Europe in a way capitulated to the idea of total control by the regime under its own conditions? Well, so the question is, Europe may have, may have understood that the regime is going to regain control over all of Syria. Um, it may not like it, it may not want to support it in any way, yeah. but it may uh, accept that it's happening. Um, so it can withhold reconstruction. Now, there is a, a flip side to that. If it withholds reconstruction, yeah. then these areas will remain uh, in a very poor state, and uh, you can expect outmigration. From them to in addition to all the refugees that are already in Europe. Yes. Um, and so what, what choice does Europe have? If it says we accept the regime's return, okay, and in addition we're going to help with reconstruction, when in fact the argument has been that there can be no stability in Syria under this regime mm -hmm. because it has already shown before two, 2011 and especially after 2011 yeah. that it has a very bad approach to its own yeah. citizens yeah. Uh, and has killed Hundreds of thousands. Yes. So, um, how, how, what kind of stability is that going to be? And why would any Syrian outside currently regime control areas accept yes. uh, that control, even if they're forcibly put back? Uh, would there be not? Will there be stability? No. These people yeah. will, of course, continue to rebel in maybe different ways than now in organized groups. But you can have uh, continued instability in many yeah. other ways. Yeah, of course you could have uh, uh, groups going underground and doing bomb yes, attacks. Of course, yeah, that could, yeah. it could take a take a long time keeping the country uh, unstable. Um, the the just one question about the regime. It it does seem that for historical reasons and political control reasons, it is very much uh, the Assad family and, and the 
it's the backbone of the security apparatus of, of the country. Yes. They seem very well uh, in control, unfortunately. Yes. Well, we've often seen with regimes that despite sanctions yeah. and military attacks, um, it's usually the civilians who suffer and die. Um, and the regime, the core of the regime that survives, Saddam Hussein is a very good yeah. example. Eventually he was brought down by a massive military intervention. Yeah. But uh, until that time he had been under sanctions and military attack for 12 years. And yeah. uh, people, uh, the whole middle class was basically destroyed, uh, pauperized. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and that's why things collapsed in 2003, yeah. by the way. Um, but the regime held out uh, through yeah. this period. Um, uh, quickly to, to Turkey and then uh, then to Iraq. Um, Turkey started very much out, let's say, improvising, uh, supporting first the, say, the Sunni uprising and then different rebels against the regime. When they saw that the Kurds were gaining a lot of, uh, of, of autonomy, uh, they, they very much saw that or still see that as their as their primary um, interest because of the PKK in, in the south uh, southeast uh, of Turkey. Um, the, um, with the, uh, this priority now uh, w w with, with Turkey, what are, let's say, the, the additional deals that Turkey is, is going to make or is likely to make? That's difficult to, to predict. Um, but what are, what are the long-term interests for Turkey? We're having three and a half million refugees uh, in the country. With um, it, it looks like they're also likely to like before the war, make a deal or to get closer to Damascus uh, again to make some kind of arrangements. What are the interests of Turkey, let's say, in the next year? Okay, no refugees, no jihadis into Turkey, but what are interests and how theoretically could they, they be served? Or at least let's map what are the Turkish needs for the coming years. So, so Turkish, the three top priorities with regard to Syria uh, are uh, to defeat or push back as much as possible the PKK and its various tentacles in the Turkish yeah. view, the YPG, uh, PYD and all the groups there. Um, so not the Kurds, what they oppose is a PKK-run Kurdish entity. Yeah. Of course, they accept the Kurds in northern Iraq as an ally. Yeah. So it's not about Kurds as such, it's about Kurds that are pliant, that do Turkish bidding. Yeah. And the PKK clearly is an enemy of Turkey. Yeah. So uh, that's top priority. The second one is to keep uh, uh, refugees, uh, for more refugees out of uh, uh, Syria and to in fact try to push current refugees in Turkey into Turkish controlled areas of northern Syria. So the the shield, the shield, shield and yeah. Afrin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and maybe to also direct anybody fleeing from Idlib to those areas rather than allowing them into Turkey. Yeah. Uh, and thirdly, to uh, and that's sort of simultaneous, is to keep jihadis out, um, uh, or to push them on, so that if they come into Turkey, then also to push them on to other states, yeah. maybe to Europe, maybe to Chechnya, uh, really Central Asia, yeah. and yeah, or the Caucasus. That's yeah. right. So, um, uh, but not to keep them in Turkey. Yeah. That's too big a danger. So that 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 is what they're aiming for now. Uh, the question is how strong or weak is their position, and I think their position is pretty weak. Mm -hmm. um, some say it's strong because they uh, they are present in Idlib, they have controlled territory in Afrin and, and Euphrates Shield, and it's true. That's these are bargaining chips. I think their Idlib position is very weak because they are actually not militarily on the ground except through observation posts. But they do have four hundred thousand troops nominally, right? The not not in Idlib. No, no, not in Idlib. But the Turkish yeah. army is is nominally uh, very big. Oh, it's a big yeah. army, yeah, but it's inside yeah. Turkey. Yeah, so, so, so it's there to guard the border uh, and, and to control these two other areas, Afrin yeah. and Euphrates Shield, north of Aleppo. So um, uh, th that is leverage that they can use. Um, but they also have big demands, these three that I mentioned, uh, yeah. defeating the PKK, yeah. for which they will need Russian help, probably, yeah. because the United States is supporting the PKK, in, in their view. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which has been a, a very uh, sore point yeah. for, for Turkey, of course, that its NATO partner and strategic ally, the United States, is actually supporting their enemy, the PKK, yeah, by conscious. arming it and yeah. using it, whatever, against the Islamic State, which may be a common enemy, but uh, still, it's, yeah. that was the wrong way. They wanted to be the one to fight the Islamic State, not its enemy, the PKK, to fight the Islamic State. So that's the sore point. So they need Russian help.
Uh, that means Russia will extract concessions. Uh, so it reduces Turkish leverage. Uh, in Idlib, of course, they need Russian help in not uh, having a military regime offensive that creates a new refugee flow and a jihadist flow into yeah. Turkey. So, so Turkey needs more from Russia than it can give Russia. But yeah. it, it does have some leverage. Okay. Um, the, um, having worked in the, in, the, in the south of Turkey, which is, of course, very close to uh, Euphrates Shield area and to, to Afrin, I mean, it's, it's obviously right next, uh, next to Turkey. Um, and there's a lot to say about Afrin and how uh, the difficult situation there. Um, should Europe mass invest in this region in the sense of, of aid? Because it's very likely that already being a very busy area for, for refugees or for IDPs, for internally displaced people, uh, is, there, is there something that Europe can play in, in, in terms of a role for these two areas that are next to each other? Well, uh, first of all, there's a problem that Turkey does not give access. Mm -hmm. So Europe may want to, but Turkey may not yeah. allow. Uh, that can be negotiated. Yeah. Um, and secondly, uh, from the European perspective, it can only be humanitarian aid. Yeah, In other words, to prevent obviously. people from dying. Yes. Um, they're certainly not going to uh, uh, provide uh, help for reconstruction, because again, that would lead to partition, uh, which they op oppose. Yeah. So, and the same for the Kurdish held areas, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, the Europeans are not, um, they may have a stabilization in the Kurdish areas, mm -hmm. but that's in order to prevent ISIS from returning. Yes. But they will not uh, provide support for so the stabilization, but not, not reconstruction. That's right. Okay. That's a clear red line for the, yes. until now. Until now. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's something to, to, to come back to uh, in, in a moment. Let me briefly go to, uh, go to Iraq. Um, uh, which you've written many articles, uh, both about the, uh, the, the, the Kurdish uh, North as well as, uh, as ISIS. The, uh, the, the Sunni Arabs um, in, in Iraq are, are still very much uh, excluded, it seems, from political power and the, the economic benefits of, the, the, say, the oil industry. Um, and uh, a lot of the support for ISIS uh, comes from these areas, obviously. Um, and is a result, in a way, from, from the development since before, but also especially since 2003, of course, with the, with the invasion. Now, with the politics not really changing that much in Iraq, correct me if I'm wrong, is this impotent, uh, impetus um, uh, towards um, uh, Syria or towards an ISIS 2.0, an underground ISIS, uh, will this persist? Uh, because of the situation in Iraq, uh, and will this influence Syria, or is it likely to be controlled either by the regime or by the, uh, uh, the Kurds? Well, the, thing, the thing is, is that uh, in both Syria and Iraq, let's say a post-conflict Syria, yes. yes, we're not there yet, but yeah. uh, and, and the current Iraq, uh, the central state has been tremendously weakened uh, by the events of the past uh, 15 years. So, in uh, Syria since 2011, in, in Iraq since 2003. Um, which means they cannot really exercise effective control over many areas. Mm -hmm. And they can also, because of the corruption that has uh, accompanied uh, UN sanctions in Iraq in the 1990s, and then uh, with the new influx of cash, uh, with the US occupation after 2003, that corruption has gone way up. And that also means that there is less money for reconstruction mm -hmm. and stabilization in areas that we needed the most because they were destroyed in the fight yeah. against the Islamic State. So cities like Mosul, uh, Ramadi, uh, Fallujah have uh, sustained heavy destruction, mm. uh, uh, more in Fallujah and Mosul than in Ramadi. And, and, that, um, uh, and that's where, of course, the grievances were uh, strongest in the first place. So if there is no reconstruction in these areas, uh, obviously those grievances are going to persist. Mm. Uh, and that means that there will always be fertile ground for renewed insurgency. And whether, whatever you call it, ISIS 2.0, uh, mm. or, or the group will have a new name, it doesn't matter. We're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's the same old. Uh, yeah. It's what used to be called Al Qaeda in Iraq. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's very likely that this will happen uh, if, in fact, there is no sustained uh, effort by the central government in Iraq to address this in a way uh, that doesn't um, further aggravate the local situation. I mean, we have, we're have we talking about camps for internally displaced people, mostly families of ISIS, uh, but also many other families, um, wh where, where everything is lacking, basically, yeah. except maybe food. 
uh, and um, you know, uh, what's it like to grow up there uh, yeah. for children? Um, if they cannot live a normal life and have opportunities that other young people have to a greater extent in Iraq, even though it's a yeah, general yeah, yeah. problem, um, then uh, you can see the, the resentment building up again. Yeah. And, and you're saying that the central government needs to, to address it. Are they likely to? Is there anything that uh, outside pressure could do? Because this is the, it's been the policy of, of the um, dominated by certain Shia parties, central government of Baghdad. What, uh, what should happen? See, so, so some pressure is, is helpful in this case. Um, for the for the government to to uh, to actually steer reconstruction funds in that area, or to allow reconstruction funds to go to these areas, yeah. if for example it is disbursed through the United Nations or international uh, organizations, uh, NGOs and whatnot, so so um, that could happen. Uh, international pressure would help, but you also have to see it from the point of view of the Iraqi government. So on one hand, they might be willing if there's mm. a prime minister who is open to that, and I think Abadi was somebody who was mm -hmm. open to that, but is not able to do it because of the pervasive corruption that is there. A lot of money just simply doesn't make its way, even if you say, spend it on that. It goes, mm -hmm. disappears in people's pockets. So there is that problem. Then second, there may be people in charge who don't want this to happen, and that you will find this especially among Shiite Islamist parties, and emphasis on Islamists. Uh, because these were the ones who suffered the most under the previous regime, and these are the ones who associate uh, the current groups in the Sunni areas, not necessarily ISIS, but any kind of mm -hmm. protest, opposition, with the previous regime. Yeah. And they say, so it's basically a fifth column, and we don't want to give them the tools by allowing them to reconstruct their, to rebuild their areas, don't want to give them the tools to then fight us. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're paranoid. Yeah, it's a catch-22. And is there some kind of uh, idea over time for reconciliation or changing this attitude? I mean, so that's a very of course deep question. Is. In any conflict, this is possible. We have seen conflicts where reconciliation worked very well, South Africa, for yeah. example. Uh, we have seen cases, and there may be others in around the world, I'm not a specialist on this, but we've seen also cases where it didn't. Um, and when these issues are not addressed properly, then conflict will recur, maybe after a generation, uh, maybe in less time, uh, maybe a bit longer, but in any case it will come back. And uh, I think uh, at the moment in Iraq uh, it's more likely to come back than to not come back, mm -hmm. simply because there is no concerted uh, effort from the top to uh, effect reconciliation. Uh, if, if we look at Syria and, and, and the surrounding countries, uh, say, you recently, I think in Germany, done some scenario exercises, and I, I have a question, um, just a general question in, the, in this direction, is uh, looking at the way Iraq is developing the, the situation in, uh, in Turkey and Syria, um, you've described already what Iraq should do, uh, ideally. Uh, is there something that um, Europe should be doing with the Middle East that it's not doing currently or that it should stop do, doing certain things? Is there, are there, are there generic recommendations looking at what the, what the region needs right now and what should we uh, ideally do or stop doing? Well, Europe is in a very weak position because yeah. for the longest time it was American hard power wedded to European soft power that uh, managed things in the Middle East. Not always very well, but mm -hmm. anyway, it managed it. Yeah. Um, with American hard power sort of on the retreat at the moment, it looks like, yeah. um, the Europeans are left without the stick that can mm -hmm. uh, actually bring things about. So, for example, if you want to prevent refugees from Syria, you cannot just close your borders, you also have to actually uh, make things, change things inside Syria. But if yeah. you don't have hard power, how are you going to do that? Um, so, and, and the Americans are not interested in doing it mm -hmm. in the case of Syria. So, um, so you're in a weak position to begin with. But um, uh, first of all, I think uh, what is in sort of strategically important is that Europe uh, should not make things worse in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, so what could it do to make it worse? Because it's well, what it has been doing to make things worse is to uh, to contribute to the militarization of the area mm -hmm. by by supporting one side militarily in a conflict. Yeah. Uh, the conflict against Daesh, for example, in the end was a military conflict um, between a coalition of states of which uh, European mem member states were, were part and, uh, and the Islamic State on the other side. Mm -hmm. 
in that kind of conflict, you are arming groups, sub-state actors, non-state yeah. actors, uh, that have their own political objectives, and mm. Kurdish groups, uh, and maybe other groups, uh, Syrian, mm. Syrian rebel groups. Mm. And that, that is, can be very problematic, because um, they have different political agendas, which may not, yeah. you may not agree with, but you may accept for the moment, because there's a bigger enemy yeah. to fight. Uh, they may uh, violate the laws of war and, and so commit human rights abuse, yeah. to put it in simple language, uh, maybe war crimes, uh, it's very serious yeah. abuse. They may be, uh, be criminal outfits or engage in crime, if, even if they're not criminal outfits yeah. as such, they may still engage in crime. They may not control their, uh, their fighters and their equipment, and that may uh, go to other groups that are jihadists, for example. Um, because these are very, it's a very fluid environment, yeah. and um, so you have, you cannot really exercise remote control over them, yeah. and that may also work against you, it may boomerang on you. Yeah. So, so all of this it militarizes the situation, it makes it worse, and it, it and any militarization will add to the refugee flow, of, you yeah. know, and, and and will not diminish it. So in the end, there has to be a negotiated solution. But again, Europe has. Uh, less leverage because it doesn't have the hard power, and that we come to a paradox because when you say hard power and you say militarization, yeah. Um, um, and so the question is, how do you use that hard power? And usually, it's, it's done worse through the threat of use of military force yeah. than the actual use of military force. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the moment, we have nothing. The only thing the Americans say, if you use chemical weapons again, <coughs> Monsieur, Monsieur Assad, then uh, we will uh, let show you what we'll do. But we've already seen what they do. They fire a few missiles, and then nothing is more symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question about this: the only place where there is, let's say, military leverage or, or pressure on the regime and Russia is in, from Deir Ezzur, or from from the Americans being present uh, there, right? So they're defending that, that area. The Americans seem likely to uh, to withdraw. Um, you see. It's, there's no sounds, there's no rumors of the French or any other European stepping up to take that place. There's no Europe who no. wants to take that role. No, nobody wants yeah. to be there. The French are there only in, in a very limited capacity, mainly to uh, uh, to sort out the, uh, the French uh, citizens among the Islamic State. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they don't have the kind of presence that the Americans have. Yeah. Um, and maybe uh, one, one last question or towards the end. Um, Europe has, and, and the different states supporting the uh, the, uh, the opposition, have uh, maintained for a long time that there should be no dialogue with uh, uh, with Assad. Um, well, unless you have a, a convincing military campaign where you fight the regime either to a standstill or you win, whether that uh, would have been a great idea is another question, of course, if we get into that detail, which we will not uh, do now, but uh, <clears throat> how do we deal with Assad? Is it time to 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 talk to Assad and the regime, and uh, um, should we um, go beyond this question by now, considering the situation? Okay, so I should be clear about who's we in this case, because it, we as a crisis group, we'll talk to anyone. Yeah. Uh, but we're not giving advice or support or anything to any actor. Yeah. Uh, we're only uh, trying to understand. Yes and try to reflect points of view so that everybody understands what everybody else thinks and mm. what motivates them, what drives them. Uh, but if we talk about we as Europeans, for example, yeah. it's EU. a different story. The EU, uh, until now, holds the position that it cannot uh, talk to the regime. Uh, but there may be member states that are more eager to talk to the regime mm. uh, and maybe do business with it. Uh, that there's financial benefit from when reconstruction mm. starts. So, can the EU maintain its unity? That is going to be a key challenge. Um, but they have moved back into Beirut and to Lebanon. from Lebanon, there's been more contact. And I think not with the regime directly. Not with the regime directly, but uh, I did have the idea of working there that there was, uh, that there was some, at least some, because many embassies were closed, uh, but other uh, very low level contacts, are they? happening or uh, low level may be, but uh, I know of course that there are indirect contacts. So first of all, uh, the, the European Union is providing humanitarian aid to regime held areas, of course, but yeah. it's channeling it through the UN and yeah. uh, other groups. They speak to the regime, the UN does of course, because Syria yeah. is a member state of the, Syria, of the United Nations. Um, but the European Union as such does not. Yeah, course, um, yeah. But it can well be, and I wouldn't be surprised to find out if 
um, some member states uh, have ongoing contacts with the regime, yeah. yes. Uh, you just briefly mentioned the, uh, the what Europe could do to make it worse, to continue militarizing uh, yes. um, the Syrian conflict and other regional uh, uh, challenges or, or tensions uh, in the future. Um, what are other things, the counter question, that it can still do well or could, could help with or could do to, to stabilize? Well, to stabilize is very difficult um, because, again, it doesn't want to stabilize areas under regime control, mm -hmm. uh, as long as this regime is in place, as long as there is no meaningful political transition mm -hmm. that is underway, um, well underway, I think is, the, is, is what they are seeking. Um, they will only provide humanitarian aid uh, to areas that are not under regime control mm -hmm. and some stabilization in areas that are not under regime control and that were under ISIS control, but so northeast Syria yeah. in particular. That would include demining and things like that. Yeah, of course. So, um, um, if 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 you don't want to deal with the regime, but the regime is retaking the entire country, then you don't have much leverage. No. And that that is the dilemma that Europe finds itself in. But um, it can do more probably to support the refugees in the surrounding states in Jordan, in Lebanon, also in Turkey. Um, especially Lebanon has, of course, a huge absorption problem. Uh, and faces a challenge that no other state faces, mm -hmm. certainly not the Netherlands, um, uh, Jordan uh, likewise. And imagine all these children uh, in the camps or not in camps mm -hmm. who are deprived of a normal life and education. They will get some, but um, could get much more if more funds were available. Yeah. <coughs> but the dilemma there is that. You have to be very careful in supporting refugee populations without at the same time supporting local populations yeah, who will otherwise yeah. become very resentful. Yeah, uh, this is uh, you often see now that there's a certain percentage yes. of the aid or um, wisely. Uh, yeah, I, I've worked for non profit organizations working in the area, and there was a percentage of, of Turks or Lebanese yes. that had to, had to benefit from the aid as well. And that's really come the last uh, two years more, more yeah. intensively, and also the demands. From the from the local government, um, um, if we look at the at the amounts uh, uh, needed for this, the, um, the the needs are humongous. I mean, six hundred, seven hundred thousand at least, I think, in Jordan, million, million and a half in Lebanon, three and a half million in uh, in, in Turkey. Um, are we being, as you are, being a bit stingy in 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 dispersing funds? Well. I don't know about the, the funds because, frankly, I don't specialize in this, and I, I'm, I'm not sure um, if uh, you know you can always spend more. Uh, but it also has to be an absorptive capacity among the uh, executing agencies and uh, and then uh, the host uh, governments. Yeah. So it's, that's a bit hard for me to judge, but um, uh, you know we have to keep in mind that um, uh, compared to the problem we face. Um, um, with refugees, these countries have a much, much bigger challenge. Uh, but the difference is, is that um, it is much less controversial politically in these countries than it is in Europe. Yeah. As we've seen that um, uh, the uh, arrival of many refugees here has um, had a backlash uh, um, in politics with mm. the rise of populist uh, anti-immigrant, yeah. anti-refugee parties. Yeah. And, um, and that, um, and that yeah. could actually make the situation much worse, because if these parties take control and take a much tougher stance mm -hmm. toward the situation in the Middle East and contribute to the further militarization, um, then, um, uh, then in the long term it's just, the problem is just going to get worse and not better. But it could also be possible that under the influence, which would be indeed counterintuitive, because uh, if these parties do not seem very uh, much focused on, let's say, helping people, um, over there, although some do argue that it could also be that as a counter reaction, uh, we could do the calculation and say, okay, this is what it costs to take care of migrants and refugees here. Why are we only spending? Because I've had a little bit of a view on the budgets because I've, as an NGO worker, sometimes you apply for, for funds and you see what you apply for and you see what it costs uh, in the Netherlands and Germany and in, in, in Sweden, where I've looked at the, especially Sweden and the Netherlands, I've looked at the figures and they're enormous. They're 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 really you could. 
give hundreds of thousand people decent pre-war salaries uh, from, the, from the money uh, we spend on integrating uh, migrants and refugees here. So the, the, um, it, it might also be that uh, certain parties might opt for saying, well, should, we should be more generous locally because we're going to pay this price one way or the other. Um, whether here or there, we might as well spend significantly more locally in the Middle East helping the country, uh, countries you've j just mentioned rather than waiting for people to, uh, to arrive uh, into Europe. Um, is, is there anything the, the, the general public debate about Syria now is currently missing that we haven't covered? You say, well, uh, this is another uh, point or analysis or, or advice that the crisis group or you give that we haven't uh, covered. No, I think when it comes to Syria, that's, that's pretty much, uh, those are the main issues. When it comes to refugee populations in Europe, that's not my yeah, mandate, yeah, yeah. my remit, so yes. my area of expertise. Okay. Thank you very much for this interview and your analysis, Mr. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity.